Hello, Endow ladies and friends. Simone here, Director of Program Growth, and I'm back on this week, Chapter 5, one of my favorite chapters from the study guide on St. Therese of Lisieux. Welcome back, Stephanie and Claire. Awesome to be with you. It's so, so good to be here. Ladies, did you hear that Pope Francis is releasing an apostolic letter? Well, by the time this is released, it will be out. An apostolic letter on the feast of St. Teresa of Avila's feast day, October 15th. Oh, wow. Exciting news. Can't I'm, wait to read it. I, know. I did hear that because a little bird named Simone told me. So I was so happy. You just it. keep me, keep me in the loop. That's all good. Such an yeah. ethereal nerd I am. I'm like, ooh, what papal documents coming out next? But <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't know that. It's also, there's a Jubilee of St. Therese right now that ends on January 7th, 2024. Stephanie, did you, maybe you told me that and I just forgot. And then it was new information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. This, this year, October 1st is the 150th anniversary of her birthday. Well, I knew, I just didn't know that that was the connection with Pope Francis's Jubilee. Like I didn't realize that was the same thing is the point. I think in Catholic, okay. Catholic dumb, there's like so many like Jubilees, anniversaries and feast days. Hey, we know how to have a party. We, do. we just like to live it up and we, mark the celebrations. We do. That's so true. It's very fun. Um, well, this chapter, Therese finally enters the cloister April 9th. 1888 and there's so much in this chapter we obviously can't talk about all of it in less than half an hour ish but uh i know what struck me but ladies what has struck you from from this chapter there's so much here well i'll i'll jump in and what really strikes me about it and and maybe it's part in in part what i what i get what i gleaned from what when what others feel and experience with Therese or what they think about Therese and how I thought about her before I actually came to know her. And um, one of those things is that, and maybe it's the idea of flowers and showering flowers in the little way and everything, but it, it sounded all very quaint and simple and um, almost saccharine and not the way of the cross not the way of the cross. And what I love in this chapter is that uh, really we find out that it was actually quite different, quite different than than the way is simple, but it wasn't without its sorrows and tremendous sorrows and mortifications. And I, I think the first being, which I found remarkable is it talks about her coming into the cloister being received. She's 15 years old at the time. I don't know what y'all were doing when you were 15, but I know who I was at 15 and I was not going to be received into a cloister without shedding a tear. Yeah. She didn't shed a tear because she was so delighted to go join her spouse. Like she knew at the core of her being every cell in her body, this is what I was made for. I was made to be a spouse of Christ. So I just, I find that quite remarkable. I, I thought it was incredible that she admitted she knew exactly what she was getting into. And she had no illusions that this was going to be easy um, because it really wasn't easy. And when I was reading about some of the conditions in the cloister and like what their life was like, much less entering a community of other women and living in close quarters with them, um, it made me think of this quote. I One of my favorite books is about the founding of a Benedictine monastery in the United States. And this book, Mother Benedict, has a real... Uh, it's just so much full of so much insight into like religious life. And one of the quote, one of the quotes from this book is by one of the religious. And she says, um, religious life is generally misunderstood mostly by people who never get to know what it's about. Entering is like the first day of creation for you. You come to find out what God has put you here for. You walk in and this place will set off all the light and dark places in you. Mm -hmm. It's a pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. You will walk into all the trials you need to clean up your act and learn how to love. 
Wow. I mean, isn't that truth? Like anytime we get into communion with other people, it's so incredibly sanctifying on so many levels. It can be uplifting. It can be inspiring and, and build us up, or it can really shine a light on our dark places. And, um, it's like sandpaper and, you know, Charles definitely encountered that. So I just, I just appreciate that. I think it's also just family life. Like there, you know, you yeah. just live with other people and you are going to, well, you're going to be sanctified or otherwise. Anyway, really, you can't stay the same. It's impossible. And she definitely came to, to know that profoundly. Yeah. Well, it sounds like marriage. <laughs> <laughs> the I pressure heard, cooker. <laughs> I heard someone just describe marriage as sandpaper. I, you reminded me, Claire, of my friend, my best friend from middle school who became a poor Claire. And I remember visiting her for the first time. It had been many, many years. And I walk in, I see her, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's like legitimate holiness here. Like, this is like, this isn't fair. You've, you've got you're like fast track to holiness where I've like progressed not to be compare because that's also in the text in this chapter, but it is stunning how it does actually work, right? Like what, yeah. what happens? I mean, yeah, just amazing. I was really moved by, I cracked up on page 60 about, um, you know, then there were the people, you know, like, like you were talking about Claire and Stephanie, like the sanctification of of religious life, but I thought of Mother Angelica who said, if it weren't for other people, we'd all be saints. Just <laughs> cracking up. Well, Actually, we no, imagine. we'd all be we'd we'd all be narcissists if it weren't for the other people. <laughs> That's true too. That's very true. I um I thought the section about prayer, you know, just the I think this is on 62, just the fact that she almost her whole, if not her entire religious life was, um, aridity mm -hmm. and not, yeah, just how difficult that is. And it's not the same, you know, as, as, as Heather writes in the text, you know, it's not the same as our culture's weary, empty indifference. It's not the vice of acedia. It's actually the quote, it's a gift of dryness, um, which really heightens up that surrender to God, because you're not feeling the, the warm fuzzies, so to speak in prayer, that part. Yeah. They moved me. Yeah. It's interesting because, um, St. Teresa of Avila, her prayer was effuse with locutions and, um, all kinds of, you know, feelings and she was she was very flowery in her prayer the lord was exceedingly generous with her and versus therese was complete dryness and and to read them i mean if you think about them just their person you would think it was opposite yeah um i think the perception is oh it was opposite you know that the therese that teresa would have been very dry and then therese would be very flowery but it was the opposite actually and that dryness I think what's so uh, exceedingly powerful about that dryness is it really tests you on what on why you're coming to prayer, right? It's going to test your your faith. It's going to test your hope. It's going to test your love, because where the rubber meets the road is: Am I going to show up whether I feel anything or yeah. not? Yeah. whether he speaks to me, whether I see him, whether I feel something, whether I'm receiving consolation. If I'm coming to the desert in prayer, that's where love gets proved. And, and I think that's really uh, something that we have to understand because I think we can often go to prayer and think, well, something's wrong because I'm not feeling anything. And we may even chase after those feelings in order to to get some sort of payback, you know, oh, I had this experience at this conference. I need to go repeat it. I need to go jump from conference to conference right. to get those highs. And I think that that's my encounter with the Lord. When that is a consolation that, to lead to a deeper prayer, to a deeper faith and a purified love that says, I love you even when I, I can't perceive you. I can't see you. I can't feel you. 
I love you even more. And my desire grows into a fire in that desire. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, I was talking about this very thing to a friend recently who is trying to get back into going to church consistently and one of the things that they say is, well, I, I was, I finally felt like it and, um, I, I got to go cause now I'm feeling like it. And so I'm trying to be as evangelically savvy as possible to, to get this person into that point of, well, it actually, it doesn't matter that you feel it and it happens to be a Sunday, uh, just go and it will start to become a habit. And then mm-hmm most likely this person will get consolations because they are at the beginning of a spiritual life, but it's pretty tricky because we think Sounds we- like a conversation I have with children sometimes before it's like, it's not about what you get out of it. Right. Yeah. But I do think it's important. Like, um, that she point that Heather King points out too, that that's not normative to live for years in that kind of darkness, that this was a special charism, which is interesting. It was this charism Mother Teresa had too, who mm-hmm. had a great devotion to St. Therese. And so they share this like particular mission to yeah. enter into profound darkness for the sake of us, um, to suffer that kind of darkness for the sake of those of us who find ourselves in it. And um but it's not like the norm. And even St. Ignatius says like in his rules of um, discernment, remember when you're there that you will soon be consoled yeah. because for, the, for most of us, the Lord does allow us, like Stephanie said, these things are purifying and sanctifying and necessary, but it's not, he's, he loves us and he does want to come to us and reassure us of his presence. And so when we find ourselves in these dark places, it can be a temptation of the enemy to think it will always be this way. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it, for most of us, it won't. So we, we shouldn't live in that place. If we find ourselves there for a long time, you know, having a good spiritual director who can help us discern what's actually happening is happening is probably really necessary. Right. Knowing that it'll come to an end um, and that the spiritual life, the prayer life, the consolations are this ebb and flow, Right. And 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 it, I think what what's probably most important when we are talking about aridity of and this dryness in prayer is the difference between I don't feel like it and dryness, where I'm not feeling anything. So if I don't feel like it, that's something that's important, as you were mentioning your friend Simone, because when we don't feel like it, we're talking about desolation. Yeah. But when we feel like going to prayer, but we're not receiving consolations, feelings, you know, flowery stuff, that means the Lord's present. We're the faith. Our faith is intact. Our hope, our desire is growing within us. So we're not experiencing desolation. It's just dryness. But the longing for him is there. But if we don't feel like it, then that's a form of desolation. And that's something to be resisted. That's something to do, you know, an examination, you know, am I okay? Have I gone to confession recently? You know, is there anything in my life that's interfering with the Lord and is causing a blockage in my spiritual life? So I think that's important for our listeners to understand the difference between aridity and then, uh, which is just a dryness, but we still long for him and we want to pray versus desolation, which means I, I don't feel like it. You know, yeah. I it's yeah. So. Yeah, I think I think that is an important distinction. I think that the word desolation does get used incorrectly, um, mm-hmm. often to mean like the the move basically that if whether I feel like it or not, I am growing close, growing in faith and in trust. So that doesn't I'm not in desolation if that's happening, regardless of my feelings. So I'm glad that you you pointed that out, um, Stephanie. And I also really appreciated from the text about. Well, I'll just read it. Whether we feel separated from God because of unwork through emotional wounds and blocks or because we've surrendered as fully as we can and been given a gift of aridity, our response is the same. We keep on praying no matter what. She says earlier, because the ultimate goal of prayer and life is union with God. So I think that's also something that is a motivation because I think Claire, we, we, we always do get something out of it. We don't always like feel like we do, but we always do because there's a difference between like the feeling and then the perception of growing in spiritual maturity or like the perception that God is here and present. 
And I think that's why, I mean, Therese is, is so spiritually mature because again, there was not those feelings, but a, a, an ever growing perception of, of God's presence um, in her life and how he was using her. And I love on page 63, she says um, that uh, basically she, I believe this will not be here below. She's talking about um, the fruitfulness of her, of her prayer and her surrender. So this again, the consolation, the consolation, oh, the consolation mm -hmm. that, right. that, that the consolation would be transferred <laughs> Mm -hmm. as like you were pointing out also Claire with mother Teresa um I love the prophetic I love that she's prophetic about that that she she knows it's it's going to bear it's bearing fruit and it will bear fruit but it's not going to be uh in her in her actual life or temporal it reminds me of our lady's words to Saint Bernadette and she's like I cannot promise you happiness in this life but in the next yeah. just be faithful well, no wonder they didn't live very long. <laughs> Thank goodness. And you know, there's a difference between joy and happiness, right? That deep, profound joy of being close to the Lord, even in spite of the aridity yeah. um, and just, you know, living the life and, and not having the suffering. So you can have suffering simultaneous with joy. And I'm sure that they did. Mm -hmm. And you can tell from Teresa's writings that she knew profound joy, um, yeah. And lived you, it. you can, you can tell from her photos. Yeah. I think she's one of the most photographed saints out there. You know, I, I've talked in previous podcasts, how she took over our dining room because she wanted it all. You know, I choose all. So I have all these extraordinary photographs of her, the light in her eyes, the joy that that comes from him. She, she effuses his light. And it's such an extraordinary gift that even in the midst of severe deprivation, you know, the, the, the cold, um, you know, a, as a novice, she often got the leftovers of the food, you know, she was second to everybody until she became fully perfect. You know, that's a lot of suffering from somebody, especially, I, I think what, too, what's striking, she came out of such um, lush, such a lush, lush life, being the baby, so adored, given everything, you know, the curls down. Granted, she lost her mother. Um, but going from that to the deprivation of, of what it meant to be a novice sister is, is nothing. And we can say, well, what, you know, why would the Lord allow that? And he allowed that to bring forth extraordinary faith, extraordinary love, you know, it, it's through those crosses and the and the way that we don't avoid them that the Lord bears fruit, right? right. Even the the aridity in her prayer is a is a cross that He invites her to embrace. Yeah. Will you come anyway? Will you pray anyway? Will you follow anyway? And let me bear fruit in and through you. Um, I I do believe, I mean, it's so evident in her, is that she was granted an extraordinary grace of faith, faith and love and hope. So if we find ourselves in aridity, I think it's important to pray for an increase in those when we find ourselves wavering, when we feel our knees buckling, when we're saying, I don't know, you know, it, 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 do I keep going here, right? Yeah. Is to pray for those increases. Yeah. Well, and it makes sense what you're saying about her coming from this like abundance, this like lush, uh, spoiled, you could say life into like she was given all that so that her love could come out of this abundance of something that she was already given. Like she knew she was deeply loved and cared for, and now she could turn around and give it away, um, which is very, very different um, than acting out of and this is addressed later in the chapter so maybe i'm getting there too soon but acting out of um codependency or a need for love like a need to please a need to people please and instead we want to give from from super the super abundant love of god something that we've first been given and then uh to turn around and, and give it away not out of our need I, I, I was very, very struck by uh, page 69. Above all, she never complained. That was part of her policy. 
Well, we all need to write that down somewhere, right? I was like, oh my goodness. Well, I think she's been mentioned. She's been called elsewhere, like the saint of the smile. And um, Mm -hmm. a smile is just a sacramental, I think. And it's so powerful when we are on the receiving end of that. A smile can heal you in a moment. And when somebody, when you don't feel like it, it also can heal you. I think it just, um, just the joy that we can express to other people and how profoundly that affects them. And then vice versa. Think about being with somebody who has a bad mood and makes no pretense of trying to hide it. Um, When you're on the receiving end of that, you know, it's just, it's, it's brutal. So Mm -hmm. here she is suffering internally, deeply and externally, and she doesn't let on that is sanctifying. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's funny in my younger years, when I read mother Teresa quotes about, you know, don't leave any, don't let someone leave you without leaving happy or smile or go home and love your family. I'm like, how can mother Teresa be saying such like silly things? Like, what do you mean smiling at someone? What do you mean happy? What do you mean? Like go home and love your family talking about Calcutta and the poor. And then of course, later on, I'm like, oh, I see what's harder sometimes. <laughs> like, what's harder? I'm like, what a weird thing for this, such an amazing thing to say to like that. But it's to your point, Claire, that like a smile can make or break our own moods, whoever we encounter. It's these, mm-hmm. it's these little things. But I, I, a friend of mine, uh, you know, 10, plus years ago, we were, we were just in a complainy, complainy phase. And we were just so sick of ourselves. So we were like, okay, for the month of October, we are just not (laughs) to complain. And if you complain, I'll call you. And if I complain, I'll call, you know, there was nothing to talk about. And so we're like, this is so sad because how can we have nothing to talk about if we're not complaining? Like, thank God we had this little Holy Spirit nudge that we've got to like fast from this. So I, I'll never forget that with my my best friend. Uh, we we're like, that's it. We're fasting from complaining for one month. And it really did change our lives. But, you know, we kind of made ourselves sick. St. Gianna said, smile at God. Oh, wow. And that really gave me pause. Like, do we just come to him to ask or to cry, which is fine. And he wants us to do that. But do we just look up at him and just smile at him? Is he longing for that from us? You know, it's a good question to ask. Well, I think, I think one of the ways you can answer that question, if you think about that out of all the creatures, we're the only ones that are capable of laughter. Mm. Which is an expression of him. That must mean that there's it's something joy. about God that has, that delights and finds humor. and <laughs> Not <laughs> sarcasm, but true delight. Yeah. True laughter that comes from your core at the absurdity of the moment, laughing at yourself you know, having a great dad joke told my brother, you know, follows the dad jokes yeah. thing, you know? And so he, he, every once in a while, he'll post in our, in our family chat, some dad joke and we're all cracking up. Yeah. And, and I, and it's, and it's balm for difficult moments. It, it's a reminder to not let the trials of life uh, get too heavy, you know? And I, I think, yeah, it's just an extraordinary gift, extraordinary gift to smile at the Lord. Yeah. So melancholic me needs to hear this probably yeah. more than most people. I was going to say half melancholic me needs, needs to hear it too. I remember coming out of mass once and there's this sweet French Armenian musician man that goes, that I'd like to see. And he walked it. just this, you know, sweet little simple friendship. And I can't have math one. And he goes, whatever it is, don't worry about it. God will <laughs> sort it out. Don't even think for a second, you know? I was like, apparently my face made it real clear that I needed to hear that. He's like, whatever you plan, it will not be. So don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Got it, got it, got it. I love, I love, I love um what uh what she writes here Idagoras she rejected all ascetic efforts which were directed not towards God but toward one's own perfection 
yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of the one of the things she talks about in that in that same area is she says Therese instinctively knew that over focusing on our insufficiency, you know, and all the way all our faults, all the things that we're doing wrong is simply an inverted form of pride, mm -hmm. you know, and and that's part of her little way is to understand that perfection is not something to be achieved. It's not about something um, that I'm going to uh, pull up my bootstraps and through my self-sufficiency and my type A personality and being better organized and updating my planner and, you know, making sure I do X, Y, Z, that I'm going to reach perfection yeah. as the father is perfect. That's not what that's about. Um, even, even to the point where I, I, you know, Dan has brought this up and, um, and, you know, I've come to delight and, and accept this as well and embrace it is that sometimes we fall asleep in adoration, mm -hmm. you know, give us a moment when we're still and quiet and we may fall asleep, um, mental prayer time, you know, that doesn't happen as often. It does for Dan more because he ha has such sleep, sleep deprivation issues with his health. Um, but the Lord, but she talks about how the Lord looks upon um, us sleeping as a parent looks upon a sleeping child. Yeah, that's that's delightful to us. Yeah, we we, we look upon that child and think rest. Yeah, rest. You're loved. You're safe. You're okay. That's what the Lord does when He sees us fall asleep in prayer. He's not standing there with a check, you know, with a checklist going, ah, she fell asleep again. She's yeah. going to have to make that up. And she better pray two rosaries tomorrow to make it up, you know, not yeah. the way the Lord works. Yeah. Amen. Amen to that. Um, yeah, that tries really to liberate me from that as well. Um, nothing puts me to sleep and good sleep like a rosary. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, it's so it's true. And I, mm -hmm. I, I, I love that I, that, that shifted in me, um, because of Therese. And as Joseph Pieper said, I think in leisure, the basis of culture, if you pray so that you sleep better, it doesn't work. But if you sincerely pray, you will sleep better. Mm -hmm. And, and I've, I've found that, uh, to be, to be personally true. I think the point that you made about the inverted like the pride thing. I, I remember um, Father Mache, who, God rest his soul, was a collaborator with John Paul II and was in the solidarity movement. He, um, a Dominican Polish priest, obviously, he, he wanted to make sure that he had become a Dominican before they sent him to Siberia. He wanted to die in his Dominican habit. And uh, so he became a Dominican, wasn't sent to Siberia, but he preached this homily, this mass that I, of his that I was at shortly before he died. And he made this point, he didn't bring up Therese, but he said, don't sit there and start counting all your sins neurotically before confession, just go to confession freely. What comes to mind, say it. What comes from your heart, say it, confess it to the Lord, but don't, you know, don't obsess over yourself. And I think he was making this, this similar point of mm -hmm. that Therese is making any, um, any other thoughts about this chapter before we conclude chapter five? I, I love, I love this chapter. I did have a, you know, I think it's around on the same page of 69 we're, that we're on right now about our imperfections and not trying to add on mortifications when we haven't even loved the people in front of us, you know, as, as we should. Um, and it reminded me, um, of this scene from the jeweler shop, which is the play that Pope John Paul II wrote before he was, I think even, I don't know, Simone, was he even archbishop at that point? Um, but it's this beautiful play about marriage. In one scene in particular, the character of Anna, who's struggling in her own marriage, is like out in the streets, just desiring to be seen and loved. And the Christ slash priest figure of Adam tells her the bridegroom is coming and she's like, you know, chasing after she sees this young man, it's the bridegroom and she's running after him and her desire is awakened and he turns around and he has the face of her husband. Mm. 
-hmm. It's the bridegroom, but he has the face of her husband. And it's just this beautiful reminder that Christ is coming to us in the people in front of us and that our loving them is the sacrifice that he desires, especially when it's hard. So we can be out trying to figure out what to give up for Lent and what to do, but it's really the mortification of our will as it comes to our self-centeredness. And that's most profoundly like lived out in that charity toward the people close to us, especially when they're setting off all our light and dark places. Right. And so um, in the context of the convent, Therese had like, it just seems like God spe- speeded up her spiritual journey so quickly Because for a lot of us, it'll take decades to get to that point where, you know, we are um, loving so disinterestedly. But I guess because her time was short, the Lord like kind of sped up this, this sped up the process. Yeah. And uh, go ahead. No, please, please, Stephanie. Well, it it reminds me because she, you know, she only studied three books um, as she was um, in, in the convent, the Bible, St. John of the Cross and imitation of Christ, I think. Oh, and St. John, um, Pierre de Cassade's, uh, abandonment to divine providence. So it wasn't like she was reading all the spiritual masters, but, but to your point, um, one of the quotes from the ascent of Mount Carmel is St. John of the Cross says, always incline your heart to what is not familiar not convenient and not comfortable, right? And that often comes in the loved ones that we've been given, those that are closest to us. And and so, you know, our sanctity is being worked out in the family that we've been given, the circumstances that we've been given, the the spouse or lack of spouse, right? The, the circumstances of illness and everything that are happening in your family, you know? Um, right now, uh, I'm the reason I'm in different, a different background here is because I'm in Dallas and I'm caring for my parents. They're getting older. My dad's had brain surgery. My mom has her own struggles. And I find myself as I'm reading Therese, praying for the Lord to help me to see him in them and in every circumstance of every moment and that, that he would love them through me. That they would encounter him in me loving them, and that I would encounter him in loving them, and see him there. So, um, what an extraordinary gift that the Lord gives us! Well, that is a beautiful way to end <laughs> this episode, and it's it's my prayer for all of us. Everything you're saying, Stephanie, and and all the particularities of our circumstances, you know. And I think about our endowed hosts who go for the unfamiliar, for the new in hosting women that they've never met. It's kind of scary, kind of like all the women in in the cloister, like Therese, you just don't know who you were going to get. And she got some interesting characters in there that she chose to love. Um, But those were the particular faces. Those are the particular faces and the conditions of, of Therese in the cloister. And then also for us who make spaces in our lives to host women that we don't necessarily know so that we can introduce them to, to beautiful saints, uh, like Therese and, and let her little way, uh, be known. And I'll just, um, read this line from story of a soul and we'll end perfection consists in doing his will in being what he wills us to be. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies. See you next week.